Today's panel is uh, Unequal Food Systems, Key Approaches in Exploring Global Hunger and Food Aid. And this panel will discuss the implications of food insecurity through a conflict development and health lens, while exploring the role of international development efforts to mitigate famine and how to achieve food system recovery and regeneration in fragile states. The panel presentation should last 40 minutes, followed by plenty of time for questions from the audience. Please send in your questions using the Q&A function and interact with social media using the hashtag CSDC2021 and hashtag unequal food systems hashtags. Okay, to begin, um, our first panelist is Professor Ru Page. She's a professor of international development studies at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences and has worked with NORAD, the World Bank, represented Norway in CGIAR meetings and has been a member of the Board of Trustees of the International Food Policy Research Institute. Um, Professor Ruth, would you like to start? Thank you very much, Helen. Um, um, hello, everybody. Um, and thanks for the invitation. I think we uh, we have very interesting times now when it comes to the question of uh, food systems. We um, we have the, the food summit 2021 coming up uh, with a pre summit in Italy next month, end of next month. And I guess the summit has got a lot of publicity, not least because uh, quite a big group of People from the academia have boycotted the, the summit, as as well as um, very many civil society organizations. So I, I think that's a good sign. Oh, in a way, um, the different narrative, so the different way of understanding what is the inequalities in the food system, and what's the problem, what is it we want to transform. Basically, everybody seemed to agree that uh, the global food system, all the food systems that is included in the global food system, uh, that, that we have big problems. But what are those problems? And if we are going to get rid of the inequalities, what, what kind of inequalities and what kind of paths and uh, how, how to deal with that? The reason why um, several people from academia and civil society organization boycott the, the food summit um, is because uh, um, the CFS, the Committee on World Food Security, that did not kind of play um, an important role, at least not in the beginning. Um, the, the lack of inclusion of agroecology and, and food as a human right. So that was kind of the three main reasons for the boycott. So I, I think this is just a good uh, beginning or uh, introduction to um, what I'm going to say now about different narratives. And um, I will focus on five different narratives on how we understand uh, or describe or think about or, 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 or look at both problems and when it comes to inequality in the food system. So first is the neo maltusian uh, understanding. Um, we, uh, I guess we all know that one with uh, uh, the, the focus on increased production and, and population increase as being the problem and uh, the Green Revolution kind of action to, to solve this um, um, and also the role of, of technology in, in that narrative. So second, we have the political economy narrative with, uh, with the focus on poverty and inequalities as, as, as the way of understanding what are the problems and, and also definitely on conflicts as much of the hungry people who will live in conflicted areas uh, and, and also uh, the kind of climate and, and, and of course now the pandemic, pandemic COVID. 
Then third, we have the um, capitalist narrative uh, that the food system is set up to make profit, not food. The way that uh, Raj Patel and uh, Eric Tolkien uh, in particular have, have framed that narrative. Um, uh, and um, the whole problem is about how we kind of define goals, what values, and our relation in, in it. Uh, fourth narrative um, some of these narratives are. are partly overlapping, but that is what I call the food justice narrative. Um, and um, it's uh, it's an interesting piece from the International Group on FAO in kind of changing the way we look at food to look at food as a public good and, and building very much on food as a right and the, the voluntary guidelines for food as a right from uh, 2004. And finally, the fifth narrative um, that has quite a lot to do with the sustainable de development goals and there is report that came out last year. And uh, that narrative I call the funding narrative that if only the donors could put enough money on, on the table, hunger, for example, would be gone. And, 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 and the promise lack of Sources and willingness to fund the action that we know that we need. So, um, when we talk about transformation, what and how, uh, I, I think it's a big, big question. And um, it will be interesting to see what will be coming out of the, the Food Summit in relation to the action tracks and game changing uh, suggestion they have up to now. I think thousand different uh, ideas for game changing actions. So, we'll so my second po point, uh, and if I'm <laughs> running out of time, just stop me, is on um, e exploring the hunger and, and food aid. And uh, coming from Norway, I, I guess um, I, I should mention that the World Food Programme got the uh, um, East Prize last year uh, for combating hunger, for contributing to better conditions for peace, and uh, for uh, preventing the use of hunger as a better war. And I think they were a very worthy winner. Of course, you can discuss that um, today, the way the World Food Program is, is, is doing it is uh, basically um, uh, helping people uh, without really solving the underlying reasons for why they, they need help. And of course, also in relation to the Peace Prize, there is a discussion that um, hunger uh, is not necessarily a reason for conflict, but conflict is definitely contributing to more, more hunger. But we did, of course, see in the food price prices years that um, when the food prices increased, there were a lot of riots in many places in in the world. So uh, uh, instability when it comes to food access can definitely trigger political instability. So I also have five points here that I think are um, important discussions points in relation to how to do better also when it comes to the humanitarian action and food aid. So the first one is on um, cash or kind or buying locally or, or imported. And I guess the, the trend is that more and and more people and countries are in favor of food relief even um, as cash or uh, are not in kind and doing whatever you can not to destroy local local markets. Um, second, I think this notion of uh, saving lives for what future is really, really important. Uh, 
humanitarian organizations are very good at saving lives, but um, uh, the recovery phase, the long-term development phase, and also the pre-phase, the preparedness phase, that's, that's where um, a lot of efforts um, thinking are needed. And then third, the notion of doing no harm. Um, Mary Anderson very well put on the agenda many years ago. I think it's still extremely important. We see uh, harm is done in so many ways in so many parts of, of the world. The case is now in Congo where WHO uh, in their Ebola project um, had really caused misuse, sexual misuse of women in an in, in extremely sad way. We had the Oxfam scandal. What we see is that uh, aid, humanitarian aid, can, can very much uh, reinforce uh, inequalities and cause new, new problems, increase inequalities. Then we have this notion of broke or broken that um, the Center for Global Development is on the agendas few years back, uh, Talbot and, and, and Border, and um, uh, they, are, they are discussing, is the humanitarian system broke? Yeah, and we see that the money is not, not by far enough and the needs are increasing a lot. Um, is it also broken? Do we need reform? Do we do it better in different ways? And what, what they suggested was um, insurance financing as one way, a different way of doing it. It could be many other different ways, but they kind of started this discussion of could we do it in, in, in different ways? Is it a need for, for this kind of reform? And finally, I think there was another discussion being raised by Clark and Durkin on Dull disasters that I thought was was interesting. To what degree um, pre-finance rule-based plans can contribute to reducing the, the the misery and the suffering? If if, uh, if we don't need to wait until the media uh, as is covering the uh, all the tragedy that goes into this kind of humanitarian crisis. But if the, if the disaster can become more dull, but politicians usually, they don't get credit for being prepared or for preventing a crisis for, from happening. They get the credit from after the crisis has been the while or they have solved it. So um, that kind of standby financing model I thought it was a very interesting uh, input into the discussion on how we can do better. So, how to conclude this? Um, I, I kind of hope that maybe the COVID pandemic contributes towards new discussion and that we could not continue where we are when it comes to inequality in the food system, but that, that we can really learn something and, and do better. Uh, and if I should say two, two main messages, uh, it would be make peace and white school meals, if I should be very, very quick. So <laughs> thank you uh, very much. Hey, thank you, Ruth. Um, I, I really... The thing is finished. Oh. Um, uh, thank you for your presentation. It was really enlightening and I think it set the scene for, for the, the rest of the panel. And I liked how you um, included that idea of uh, Mary Anderson do no harm and then also uh, thought about how food aid could then actually do harm through maybe the corruption of it. And I think that's a great idea if anyone wants to ask any questions about it at the end. Um, our next uh, panellist will be drawing upon her research in school food aid programmes in Mali. Dr. Elisabetta Aurinio is a research fellow at Imperial College London and is an economist with a focus on global food security issues. 
child and adolescent development and food related social protection programs. Um, Dr. Elisabetta, would you like to join? Sure. Um, hi, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to the organizer for uh, putting together this exciting conference and panel. So I will share my screen. Um, okay. Okay, so also thank you so much Ruth for um, uh, setting the scene as Ellen uh, mentioned and uh, I really couldn't agree more with your last uh, words of conclusion because you mentioned school feeding which is one of my main uh, areas of research so um, yeah that's great thank you so much. So today um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about research uh, myself and other colleagues um, such as Aulo Gelli, Jean-Pierre Tranchant, Amadou Sekudialo, and really uh, actually a broader team um, across the UK, Mali and the US have been doing on emergency food assistance and child development. And I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the contrasting effects that um, we may found when uh, uh, emergency food assistance is deployed on two important domains of child development, nutritional, uh, nutrition and education. So first of all, why should we bother uh, with child development in conflict? So um, we have uh, many, many children around the world that are experiencing conflicts or, not, or other forms of violence in the world. This is a the staggering figure of one in six children in the world and um, turns to be 357 million children. And we know from a vast literature that uh, exposure to violence and conflicts really can have devastating, devastating effects on children's uh, life courses through disrupted uh, nutritional and educational trajectories. And in fact, these effects not only um, um, stick with the child as they grow into adulthood, but also can have a repercussion on the next generation. So it's really important to support children development uh, domain, uh, even and especially more if they are experiencing conflicts. Um, we have that food assistance is widely used in conflicts and other emergencies to address acute needs. So for instance, although there have been calls and actually cash transfers are increasing uh, um, uh, in, in, the, in their use is increasing in emergencies and other humanitarian uh, settings, still generalized food distribution. So really the distribution of food parcel is still the biggest component of uh, humanitarian assistan assistance globally, for, um, accounting for between 25 and 30% of global humanitarian assistance. And then in the past uh, um, two decades, we've, we've been witnessing a, a steep increase in the uh, number of school feeding programs that have been scaled up or introduced uh, in uh, humanitarian emergencies. And uh, really, this, uh, these last bits um, uh, relate to the point that uh, uh, Ruth made about not only thinking about humanitarian needs, but also thinking about development. And really, food, uh, food assistance can bridge this gap and social protection more generally by um, contributing to um, supplement for needs that uh, households in crisis face, but also by uh, uh, fostering nutrition and potentially education, for instance, as in the case of school meals, they can really uh, contribute to development by um, supporting human capital accumulation of children. However, despite this very important potential role, we really just don't know much about the, the effects of humanitarian food assistance and in general food assistance on child development in crisis. Um, and in turn, this lack of knowledge translates into lack of action. So just to give you the example of education, um, education is considered one of the pillars of humanitarian interventions alongside food, shelter and health, yet only 2% of total uh, humanitarian assistance goes to education programs. So we have a huge uh, financing gap there. So, um, we, we're going to explore these issues uh, uh, by using um, the Malian conflict as a case study. So we, we work uh, specifically in Mopti, that is in uh, central Mali, so it's around here. And Mali is one of the poorest countries in the world. 
We have a structure of food insecurity with the millions of, uh, of people that every year are considered by FAO and WFP as food insecure or, or extremely food insecure. And also we have very low educational outcomes, even for sub-Saharan African standards. For instance, we have, uh, on average, adults have only two years of schooling and primary enrollment rate, which on average in the continent are around 80 to 90 percent, here are below 60 percent. So we have a really deprived uh, context with also gender inequalities in education. So we, we, when we started to do this research, we, we didn't, uh, our plan was not to uh, evaluate humanitarian food assistance on child development. We had completely different plans that were um, to evaluate the, the government school, me, uh, school meals program on child development and agriculture. So uh, we started our research in 2012, uh, we did our baseline study and we were ready to uh, roll out a randomized control trial on school feeding. And then after a month, we completed our, um, our baseline, we had a coup d'etat. And basically, especially in central and northern Mali, um, there is a lot of um, violence that kicks in, a lot of insecurity. Uh, we have development partners and government that uh, um, kind of run away from the areas that are most affected. And we have the humanitarian sector uh, coming in. Um, specifically, we, um, we focus on WFP uh, food assistance. So uh, I'm gonna draw on some um, three, four key findings from these two papers. So these are papers that actually are part of uh, uh, some uh, special issues that Tillman has edited. So um, yeah, you're, you are, if you're interested in the area of food assistance in conflict and emergency, I really invite you to, to have a look at not only at these two papers, but really at the, at the collection of papers because they're really interesting. And um, given the little time, I will focus on four main findings. So the first of all uh, relates to how food assistance was deployed. First of all, uh, when we started to do the research, so we got money to come back to this, go back to these households uh, five years after uh, the baseline. And uh, um, we went to both households and villages that we initially sampled uh, for our research. And we really did a, a careful investigation, not only with quantitative tools, but also really interviewing uh, humanitarian actors, WFP, but also other actors and also villagers to understand what happened on the ground. Because one main finding was that it was not clear how food assistance was deployed. Probably there is a crisis, a lot of uh, um, actors come in and there is a bit of a mess. And it seems there, is a, there isn't really a lot of um, uh, organization, not, not organization, but really it's difficult to understand how things went on the ground. And in fact, when we look at the um, at our uh, villages and households access to aid, we saw that uh, um, households that were most affected by the conflicts, uh, um, as measured by the proximity to armed groups, were actually the ones that uh, um, obtained less aid. And this is a, a bit uh, uh, counterintuitive if we think that um, aid should be prioritized uh, to most affected population. But this, on the other hand, also reflects the fact that. Uh, is actually when a conflict uh, kicks in, it's actually most, more difficult to get more affected households. So I think you, it's important to kind of uh, have this broader overview of how uh, aid was deployed. In our sample, 65% of households did not receive any form of food assistance and 23% um, received the general food distribution. So really packages like this of food and 60% received school feeding. The second main finding relates to the welfare, so food security and, and broader welfare indicators of the households. And we see that actually receiving either type of uh, uh, food assistance, whether it was a GFD or school feeding, uh, improved the household welfare indicator as measured by, for instance, uh, total expenditure or uh, food expenditure. Okay, so there is a, this is good news. When we look at uh, nutritional indicators of kids as measuring by height, we don't see um, a strong effect on, on children's growth um, unless households receive one, uh, more than one form of food assistance. There may be also um, measurement errors there because, yeah, we can leave that for, for the Q&A. And this is uh, uh, findings from the Transcham paper. So we find that overall there was improved the household food security and welfare. 
On the other end, when we look at education, we find the diverging effects of the two forms of food assistance. For instance, uh, this graph charts the uh, coefficients related to the, to the effects of uh, exposure to different uh, forms of um, food assistance. So any aid, uh, school feeding, and generalized food distribution. And you can see here that uh, if uh, a household had a child that was enrolled in school feeding, actually the chances of this child to be enrolled in school were uh, 10 uh, percentage points higher. And this is quite uh, a large increase uh, compared to the baseline very low enrollment rates uh, in, this, uh, in this region. Um, also, we would have a similar picture for grade attainment. So kids also not only are more likely to be in school, but they also are likely to um, do more years of education. However, so we find this positive effect of school feeding on child education. On the other hand, if we look at the effects of generalized food distribution, we see that increases absenteeism a lot <laughs> for the kids that uh, whose households uh, were receiving a GFD, especially among boys. So this, this effect is tangible in the sense that a child whose household was receiving GFD was more likely to increase, uh, to be more uh, absent from school an additional day per week as compared to comparison kids, okay? And when we looked at the child labor, we see that uh, actually kids that are more absent are not uh, um, to uh, tolerating around, they're actually working more in the farm. So there is a, really, there, there is this, uh, um, this, uh, this differential, um, I mean, this uh, mechanism that we find through child labor. So just to conclude, uh, what I would like you to take on from this presentation is that there may be trade-offs when we employ, the, uh, when we employ um, food assistance in emergencies. Because uh, it, it really, if we focus on child development uh, and for instance on education, um, the, the, the net effect will depend on how uh, the transfer will of offset the opportunity costs of labor. So school feeding uh, provides an incentive to, to get to school because the kids will receive the transfer only if they are in school. While GFD doesn't allow, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't give this uh, incentive. And in fact, we find that, uh, um, that kids uh, stay at home uh, more. On the other hand, we do find that actually the effect of GFD on broader household welfare was larger than school feeding. So it really depends on what, uh, which weights are we attaching to these different dimensions. So um, yeah, to conclude, the combined findings from these studies really suggest that there are important trade-offs to consider when providing food assistance during conflict, especially in this setting like Mali, where structural food insecurity is very high to start with. And so, yes, this would be important to consider if we are joint program, if we're, if we're programming this, this program. So thinking not only on the effects on nutrition, but also what happens on other important dimensions for development. So um, yeah, if you have any question, I'm happy to, to, to discuss later. And also we can continue the conversation um, if you have additional questions after this day. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for your presentation. Um, if uh, anyone wants to read any more about the research that Elisabetta has been doing, I'm sure we can provide a link for that in the chat. Um, I, as a reminder, please send in all your questions using the Q&A function. And I'd like to move on to our next uh, panellist. Uh, so our penultimate panellist is Professor Tillman Brook who will be discussing the long-term challenges to food security and the importance of institutions to help achieve food security. Not only is Professor Tillman a professor of food security, state fragility and climate change at the Natural Resources Institute of University of Greenwich, but is also the founder and director of International Security and Development Center. Um, professor Tillman. Thank you very much, Helen, and thank you for organizing this wonderful session and um, the interesting conference. It's a, a pleasure to be here, and I was torn between what to present because I really care deeply about the topic of, of this panel, and I work on that, and I do a lot of research very similar to what Elisabetta presented, and that's sort of where my heart is. I try to understand how people respond to crisis and conflict and what their behavior is and what their welfare is, including in, in food choices and uh, nutrition and food security. and so. So those are really important topics. I do work a lot in the global south, and I, I normally I travel a lot. But um, 
but then I thought maybe this was a good occasion to zoom out a bit. And I'm actually involved also in some projects which increasingly look at some of the more, if I can say universal or common elements in the food system, which are relevant. So in that sense, perhaps a bit closer to what some of the things that Ruth was talking about. Um, and so um, I thought I want to present some scenarios and, uh, and, and to think ahead a bit and to think through what might happen in say 50 years time. And so just in case you get worried, you know, it's not gonna be sci-fi, right? I'm not gonna um, fly to outer galaxies with you. Yeah, I'm not gonna completely loony yet. Um, uh, I'm getting there, but uh, not yet. So I want to still stay scientific and still um, think through um, what might be in the future and, and to allow some new thinking perhaps and to uh, be a little bit more creative. As I said, I love surveys and I love data, but sometimes it really forces us to be very specific on that particular context. I'm not gonna do a prediction, but I'm gonna go, what if? So what if circumstances change and what could happen then? So like a couple of thought experiments and I'm maybe three or four thought experiments. And the first one I would call no land. And that's essentially the realization that most of agriculture, I mean, wh wherever you are, has this sort of model. I mean, of course, in the context where Elisabetta did her research in Mali, you know, people don't have these big tractors, but basically you work the land and you work it in two dimensions from right to left and front to back, yeah? And, and you grow your crops or you, uh, grow, or you grow your cattle on it or your animals, yeah? And so, so the productivity and the, the, the food and the crops and so on, they come from land. But what if you took land out of agriculture? What would be left of that? Yeah, and that could be anywhere. It could be in, in the global north, it could be in the global south. And there's many reasons why you should think that in the future land um, may not be so available. For example, think through Chernobyl, the, if you remember Chernobyl, the um, nuclear disaster, which made some soils um, temporarily or long-term unusable. Or, um, so that would be one reason, pollution basically, yeah, could uh, spoil uh, land. Um, it could be uh, animal pests. So where I live near Berlin, there, there are, um, there's some disease which uh, affects the wild boar. And so the farmers are not allowed to crop the um, fields where the, uh, where the wild boars roam freely and the, um, uh, the crops are uh, contaminated with these diseases. Um, so that could be another one. Or it could be urbanization, you know, I mean, massive forms of urbanization where maybe the transport and, and, and uh, uh, travel costs are so high that you have to grow crops locally and you cannot import anymore. You know, if you think of the future mega cities. So, so let's just remember, you know, land may not be available in, anymore in the future. But the other thing that may not be available in the future is uh, um, globalization and trade and, and food from really far away. So, you know, um, in buying bananas in the UK is, is of course a luxury because they're not typically grown in the UK and it would be crazy to grow them in the UK because it costs too much uh, energy. So I have this I have this customs officer here, yeah? And he says, no way, yeah? Like, don't continue. And, and you might say, um, you know, that's, that's not likely. We're such a globalized world and everybody eats bananas. Um, or well, many people like eating bananas, at least in the UK. But um, as we saw with Trump, suddenly trade barriers went up. Yeah, and it wasn't, and there are other leaders like that who, who believe in nationalism and who, who don't believe in globalization. And um, whether that's in, in Brazil or in India or in Russia, yeah, so all around the world, there are political leaders who, who put a barrier um, on um, trade. And I don't even have to talk about Brexit. So um, th that's a reason. Or with the Suez Canal, remember that big boat that got stuck? I, I'm afraid I didn't find a prop of a big boat, yeah, but. Um, uh, the big boat that got stuck in the Suez Canal and inhabited, uh, inhibited world trade for quite a significant while. And it was just one boat getting stuck in one place. Um, so our trading system is very vulnerable. And if we don't trade anymore, we can't buy those bananas or those grapes from you know, South Africa. And, and our food uh, changes. And, and even food uh, for very poor people um, will change because it changes the markets and it changes the prices and it changes the integration. Our, all our food systems are highly global, even if you even if you eat your own local food, you're still competing with, with global food. Food aid is a form of globalized uh, food trade, actually, yeah, except the terms of trades are awful and it, uh, of course, has the risk of could potentially destroy markets. There's a third scenario I want to go through, and of course, that's on everybody's mind. It's the no climate scenario. Yeah, What if it gets really, really hot? Yeah, really, really hot. Or what if it gets... Um, uh, the weather gets so variable that it becomes really difficult to use that tractor I showed you earlier. Yeah, drought, rising water levels, uh, unpredictable weather, and then of course heat shocks. We know that heat changes the way we behave. Yeah, if it gets really extreme in the heat shock, yeah, this is this is your best bet. Yeah, but if um, even if the heat is marginal, um, our decisions are clouded. We eat differently. The food we eat changes. You know, we we want ice cream, we want Coca Cola, or 
um, you know, hopefully just drink lots of water, but hopefully it's clean. Yeah. So hopefully you have the water you can drink to maintain the, hopefully you can boil the water or otherwise purify it if you, if you don't have tap water. Yeah. So getting clean drinking water in, in, a, in a hot climate is critical. And so these are not just problems in the north where maybe we're not used to hot weather. These are, these are um, challenges that we face everywhere and it changes our food consumption and it changes our behavior and it changes our, our judgments. And I do experiments on that. I put people in a, in a greenhouse and I heat the greenhouse all the way and I see how their, their behaviors change, their food behaviors, but also their group behaviors. We have a lot of people who interact with each other in in groups and we know from other academic research that uh, people who are exposed to high temperatures are more likely to engage in violent conflict. So, so we even have um, different um, scenarios that interact where we have with climate change, we're more likely to have conflicts. With conflicts, we're more likely to have less trade. With conflict, we're more likely to have less land um, because maybe it's mined. That's another reason why you might have no, no land. And so we have interaction effects between these different large scale scenarios and, um, and they're significant, these interaction effects, and they, they impact on people at many different levels. They impact on, on individuals through their life course. Um, there's research which um, shows that if your childhood development is impacted, your later life, you're less productive, and, and maybe even the children of children whose early life course was negatively impacted by external shocks will be impacted. So you can even pass this on intergenerationally. It's within families, um, different people within a family of different jobs, maybe men and women, and uh, and there will be different differential impact within families and inequalities within families. It will be within countries, whether it's different regions, different social groups, different socioeconomic groups, different ethnic groups, different you know dwellers, urban versus rural, for example. And of course, it will be between countries. And so these shocks and crises and influences, these system changes, they they impact on on how we relate to each other, the impact on how our food is produced um, and, how, and also how our food is consumed. But it's not just um, a production thing and it's not just that we need you know, a lot more uh, sort of genetic uh, engineering or anything like that. I think the important thing is it's a societal issue and it's how, how societies are configured and it's how institutions are configured and it's how we, yeah, how groups in our, in our societies deal with each other. And interestingly, you, um, we are increasingly seeing that food, for example, um, becomes an identity issue, yeah? And so you have people who maybe um, like their red meat and who define themselves through that and a good Barbie on the weekend um, who means something to them. And then you have other people who are very proud vegans, yeah? And who define themselves through that. So group identity, it's, it, being vegan is one of the simplest way of changing your group identity, yeah? Changing your gender and ethnicity is much more difficult, yeah? And so you have um, intergroup conflicts potentially in the society. We see that in today's fractured societies, yeah, and I only again need to say Putin and Trump and uh, Bolsonaro, yeah, and we see how different identity politics are being played off against each other, and I think food and food systems are at the heart of that, and they're increasingly going to be used to, uh, to define identities, and what we eat and how we eat is critical in the future for our society, and I think it's already critical uh, today, and whether it's a, a place where people are very hungry and where survival is acutely endangered, or whether it's a place where, where people are lucky to, on average, to be incredibly well off. And I think in both places and anywhere in the world, food really matters. It has always mattered, but it will continue to matter and will continue to shape our societies and, and re both reflect our inequalities, but also um, further our inequalities. So maybe not an altogether positive outlook, but uh, um, that's my, my take um, on the subject. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tillman. It's, it's really good to zoom out and have that look about how the future of food, not in the uh, global south or the global north, but the ideas that prevail and influence both of them. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, our final speaker of the panel needs no introduction. Uh, Professor Alex Duval is a, an executive director of the World Peace F Foundation, a research professor at Fletcher School of Global Affairs, Tufts University, a professor professorial director at London School of Economics and has authored numerous books, including Mass Starvation, The History of Future Famine in 2017. Um, Professor Alex will be speaking about the concept of starvation as a weapon of war, uh, using the ongoing famine in Tigray, Ethiopia as a case study. Professor Alex. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you, though it's a very dismal topic to talk about. So when I published my 
book. In fact, when I started writing that book, Mass Starvation, um, some five years ago, I was pretty optimistic that the era of great famines in the world was over. Um, I made the case that over the hundred years from approximately the, the height of European imperialism in the 1870s until the 1970s, about 10 million people around the world every decade had perished in great and calamitous famines. That's famines that kill 100,000 or more people. And that these numbers had actually dwindled remarkably. We hadn't seen famines on that scale. Um, over a period of more than 40 years, the, 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 the most terrible famines of our generation in North Korea, in Ethiopia, um, in, in, in Somalia were actually on a, first of all, on a smaller scale. Yes, they killed several hundred thousand people each, but they went these calamitous famines that we'd had before. And they were becoming rarer and our response to them was becoming more effective. Um, there were some warning signs as the book went to press that all was not well. There were some uh, disturbing signs of, of famine being back, the so-called four famines in, of 2017 in Somalia, in northeast Nigeria, and South Sudan, and in Yemen, and also starvation in, uh, associated with sieges in Syria. In all cases, what was key to the, the, the resurgence of, of starvation was a combination of armed conflict, the decay, the dismantling of state institutions, and in some cases, the deliberate use of hunger as a weapon of, of war. And um, there was, I was happy to see a resurgence of international concern around this. There was a UN Security Council resolution 2417 on armed conflict and hunger that was passed just over three years ago that uh, requires the UN Secretary General to alert the Security Council um, if there is a case in which armed conflict is threatening widespread food insecurity. And it, and it brings some tools to bear. It says those who are ob obstructing humanitarian assistance may be subjected to, to sanction. It, by bringing it to the Security Council, it also alerts the Security Council, the world, that um, hunger and armed conflict are an issue of, of uh, international peace and security. There was also an amendment to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court if, um, on, on the, the crime of starvation during war, which had been prohibited for international armed conflicts and, and the extension and the prohibition was now extended to uh, civil wars in non-international armed conflicts. And the, the crime of starvation in international law, the definition is very important. It is the destruction uh, or the rendering useless or the removal of objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population. So that can be food, it can be water supplies, it can be medicine, or it can be maternal care for, for, for children. Anything that is um, indispensable to survival. Um, so starvation is, is a slightly broader concept in law than it is in, in, in everyday use. Now, sadly, what we're seeing is that um, atrocity famines are, are back and are resurgent around the world. There are cases from, um, from Congo to Myanmar to Nigeria is again back. Um, Yemen has not gone away. But the worst case, the most egregious case, is the current famine in, in Tigray. And what we have seen just yesterday, actually there was a remarkable round table um, in advance of the G7 summit in which uh, the UN Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Mark Lowcock said, this is famine, there is famine now. Um, Samantha Power, the administrator of USAID, you know, said very clearly, this is famine caused by hunger being used as a, a, as, a, as a weapon of war. Um, the US Special Envoy said at the end, um, Special Envoy for the Horn, who reports to President Biden, said we should not have to count the graves of the children who have died before we declare this a famine. 
Um, the European Union was very prominent there. The UK, I'm afraid, is, 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 is having once been a, a, a vanguard at the lead of, of humanitarian action and, and, and so on has, has, has slipped um, to the back of the queue somewhat uh, with the for reasons we all know and we don't need to go into. Um, so this is a, a, a man-made famine that we have in, 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 in Tigra. Um, there is really no natural element here. There is a background of poverty, but seven months ago, you know, the, the area was, was, was defined as essentially food secure. Ethiopia had itself over the last 30 years demonstrated that despite the challenges of drought, uh, climatic adversities, et cetera, et cetera, it could run enormously effective relief programs and implement in hugely ambitious and efficacious um, domestic welfare programs that went, meant that when there was a harvest failure, uh, rural people did not descend into poverty. They did not have to sell their assets. They could keep their ch children in school. They could keep their livestock. They could keep their seeds. And so Ethiopia was, as it were, emblematic of the fact that famine could be conquered, just as Ethiopia is now emblematic of why it is returning. And it is returning because not only is hunger being used as a weapon of war, it is also being used as a weapon of extermination. And let me come back to that particular point, man-made. There are three key elements to what is driving the famine here. Three key and then, and then some ancillary ones. One is pillage the systematic dismantling of an economy. Um, and this is not looting just by soldiers out of control. This is looting designed by the coalition partners in this war, the government of Ethiopia, the government of Eritrea, systematically dismantling industries, universities, ethnic cleansing of Tigrayans from the most fertile areas um, of, 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 of their province. There is destruction of objects indispensable to survival, burning of food, um, uh, vandalizing and, and ransacking health clinics, ripping up uh, 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 and, and destroying water supplies, many of them paid for by international donors. The UK's Department for International Development essentially provided the funds for the, the, the urban water supply in Makale. That has all been stolen now. And I wonder what our government in the UK is going to do. The fact that UK taxpayers' money was used to build essential infrastructure, which has now been stolen by the very government that is our, quotes, development partner there. Um, and then there's a, another element there. I mentioned maternal care. There is, um, it is now very well documented, widespread and systematic rape. And there are some very, very disturbing uh, videos of the Ethiopian prime minister making jokes about this, um, essentially trivializing and encouraging his soldiers to commit sexual violence because he says it doesn't, essentially doesn't matter, ha, ha, ha. Um, so when there are, you know, the, the Ethiopian attorney general has gained a bit of praise for prosecuting 20 odd individual soldiers, the prosecutions should not stop at those individual soldiers. We all know that when there is widespread and systematic rape in war, it is not because soldiers are feeling frustrated, it is because they are told to do that by their superiors and they are given license by their, their, um, their, 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 their political leaders. And we see a man who um, I'm afraid was a Nobel Prize winner, um, ex you know, very, very clearly encouraging mass rape. Now this is relevant because um, rape is a crime. Widespread and systematic rape is a crime against humanity, but rape is also a starvation crime because a female survivor of rape often cannot care for herself, let alone care for her children. There are so many abandoned, unaccompanied children, tens of thousands of children. Many of those children are abandoned because their mothers were taken away and gang raped, help, held in sexual slavery, and then have somehow made it to a hospital. But they are separated from their, their, their young children. Imagine the torment of these, of, of, of these women. Um, there are, and we all know in these situations that are, you know, 
children who who do not have that maternal care who are who are left on that to basically to fend for themselves or on the charity of their nature of their neighbors how desperately vulnerable they will be um we are the, 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 the famine is already sufficiently advanced that we know tens of thousands of children will die. And it is these children who sadly are the most vulnerable. Um, the, the report that came out yesterday from the integrated food security phase classification conservatively estimated that 350,000 people are in famine conditions and that nearly 2 million more are approaching that stage. Um, their assumption, their prediction going forward is premised on the assumption that there will be an aid operation. But the fact is that the aid operation is fairly meager. It is being presented as being much more than it is because a lot of the food that is reported to have been distributed has been signed for, but then has been looted. Um, so the, 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 the numbers of quotes recipients are, are, are exaggerated. And the, the, um, there are 131 access violations that were reported in, 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 in the last month, 130 of those by the Ethiopian and Eritrean coalition forces, just one by, the, um, by another unidentified armed group, the resistance. This is a, and there's a campaign to choke off um, humanitarian assistance to 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 Tigray. So the the a, a an unfolding of a famine that would kill perhaps a couple of a hundred thousand people by people I mean overwhelmingly children over the next six months is actually a, an optimistic scenario. It could be much worse than that. The great famines are back. Now a couple of of of, of final points on this. One is that the the um, the, the cause of this internationally is the breakdown of the multilateral system. That, that the mechanisms for warning and preventing this happening were all working a few years ago. They were dismantled. They were set on one side. It was given the, the, those who engage in the sort of transactional brutal politics of the Middle East were given license to do what they wanted by the Trump administration and by the decline in clout of the United Nations and especially the African Union, which has essentially disappeared from the scene in the last few years. And what we see at the moment, we saw, and we see over the, we'll, we'll see it very clearly over the next week, is an attempt by the Biden administration and the European Union to reconstruct some of that multilateral order at the G7, and they're going to push it once again at the UN Security Council. This major conflict that, in the words of the US Special Envoy Jeffrey Feltman, is going to make Syria look like a picnic, um, has unfolded for seven months without the UN Security Council once taking this issue in a public session or passing any sort of resolution. And that, and once again, it is going to be pushed back to the UN Security Council by the US and, and, and the EU, and we shall see if it works. We shall see if those fundamental ethical standards that have sustained the reduction in the, 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 the numbers and, 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 and horror of those famines, whether that is going to work. And then the, my very final point is, is, is a, a point about hunger creating conflict. There is, I think, no doubt that starvation crimes inflicted in this way will generate a level of bitterness and anger among the population affected, such that, that they will be motivated to fight and to, 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 to resist. And we know from you know, the past famine crimes from Ireland to Ukraine, that these stay on in the collective memory for generations, um, breeding anger, uh, resentment, and, and, and forms of, of virulent nationalism. So it is desperately important that this um, major famine crime be acted upon as, as, as immediately and as quickly and as effectively as, as, as we possibly can. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alex, for your um, presentation. You've taken quite a, a sensitive topic and you, you um, introduced it in a way that will help people understand it. Um, before we move on to the question and answers, can I just ask for the people who um, are not familiar with your work, can you just maybe explain a little bit about the warning signs of famines uh, that you mentioned at the start of your presentation? Well, there, the, the sort of the conventional warning signs and systems are based upon on, on a quite a complex assessment of nutritional rates of, 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 of food economies and so, and so on. And these, um, the, the, the most sophisticated one is the integrated phase, uh, food security phase classification system, which is used by the US famine early warning system and, and others. And, 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 and you can go onto their, their, their website and you will see different colors ranging from green being food insecure through to red being emergency. Um, these don't work terribly well when there is conflict, but we know enough about conflict to be able to project forward. It just becomes politically controversial to do so. And so what we have in a case like Ethiopia at the moment is a government that will be twisting the arms of humanitarian agencies saying, don't you dare declare famine? And we will find all sorts of circumlocutions and, and methodological problems with the sophisticated systems of, of identifying famine. For example, by saying that the thresholds have not been reached by enough people in one particular place to declare famine, that it doesn't really count. But frankly, anything that kills you know, 300,000 children through, through mass starvation, in my book, is a famine. And those who deny it are complicit in that um, uh, in, in that denial. And what we've seen in Ethiopia is, is, is in the last six months is enough evidence of those starvation crimes to know the direction in which we are heading. It, 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 we, it is not rocket science to, to, to know that um, if you have a population that is dependent upon certain forms of, of, of income, livelihood and food, and you remove those, then of course they're going to stop. Brilliant, thank you. I definitely think uh, you're right there. And there is that twisted concept that um, someone cannot die from hunger unless famine has been, um, has been classed by the government. And a lot of governments try, try not to class it because it, it puts them in the wrong and it's their actions that have then caused that. Um, so I'm going to open up the, the panel to a discussion now, question and answer. And I'm going to be a bit self-centered and ask a question that I want to ask first. Um, and it's, um, as food aid um, has been created to be supplied in the short-term instances, um, when considering the increased number of complex emergencies and protracted conflicts, how has food aid adapted to longer-term support? And has this created any challenges? Uh, would anyone like to jump in first? Shall I, shall I nominate? <laughs> uh, uh, Professor Tillman, how about you start? I, sorry, I was going to ask whether Alex starts because apparently he has to leave soon, right? So if you want to. Of course, and I'll type the question in. into the chat. Apologies, I was just actually answering another question that came up in the chat, which is um, how, where does accountability lie? Has famine as a tool of war ever been pursued as a war crime? And let me just first answer that. And, 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 and there is a chance that um, Sudanese President Bashir may be prosecuted under the, uh, at the International Criminal Court um, for starvation crimes committed in, 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 in Darfur. It's not sure whether that will actually happen. And there is certainly, if there were to be an appetite for, for um, uh, for a, a, a uh, international prosecutions, there's no doubt that especially Eritrean president Isaias Afawoki would be you know, in the sights for that. Um, uh, it may be a little more difficult to go after Abiy Ahmed, but a number of his generals would certainly be, be um, extremely exposed to, 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 to that. Um, 
and then on 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 food aid um the i mean one of the tragedies about ethiopia is is that it was at the forefront of moving away from the this sort of conventional, you know, humanitarian uh, emergency response towards what they call the productive safety net program, and indeed towards what you know Ruth was was describing as the dull disasters approach of drought insurance and so on. These, these, these up to date um, financial systems, and, and now we're back into the 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 bad old days of of emergency feeding and food aid being manipulated for, for uh, political and, and, and military reasons. And um, it is, and, and I, what I fear we will see unfolding in Tigray is a sort of protracted emergency in which the, um, the economy has been reduced to such a level that you know, several million people are for a long time dependent upon an international food aid pipeline. And the, the key belligerents can turn that on and off at will in order to keep that population um, subjugated. It's, it's, it's a truly appalling situation. Maybe if I may to build on that, um, on your question, Helen, um, I think it's important to bear in mind that depending on the setting, and you know, maybe Tigray is, is one particular setting where, as Alex rightly says, you know, the government and, and the actors can switch this on and off, sadly, but um, there are people who are hungry in other settings for other reasons. And food aid is sort of, you know, giving somebody something to eat. I guess you could go back to the biblical image, you know, sort of giving somebody fish is nice, but giving them a fishing rod is better, yeah? And so this um, differentiation between food aid and the humanitarian sector and emergency help on the one hand, and the larger issue of development and livelihoods and um, having enough, um, income to sustain yourself, your family, et cetera, is, is another issue at face value, but we have to think them in a joint way. And you may, um, or if we also think about like say social security systems in Western Europe, you know, some people have good income and a good job, they lose their job. Um, maybe they can't pay the mortgage, they might lose their house, they might even become homeless. And in a, in a welfare state, you know, the government would then step in and provide you maybe unemployment benefit or social security payments to see you through that rough patch. And then uh, maybe you can keep your house, yeah? And you, you get another job three or six months later and then you have decent income again and then you yeah, can stay where you are and you have enough food at all times. And so individuals fall into poverty, you know, for example, um, single moms are often very food insecure, both in Northern and in Southern countries, yeah? And so how can we make sure that this sort of life cycle poverty or after losing a job or um, or because the weather fails, yeah, the you know rain fails. Um, how how can we insure against that as part of a larger system of insuring people against life threatening risks? And so I think we need to think through social protection and welfare systems and state capacity and and other forms of entitlements. Yeah, like Amasa Sen sort of view of entitlement. It's not just about food aid or or money. You know, maybe um, social networks. Yeah, maybe your wider family can help you if you are short on something, income or food or whatever. Yeah, and so how can we strengthen that? How can we not lose these social networks that can also be quite effective in helping people? Um, family networks, kinship networks. Yeah, they can act as insurance mechanisms basically if the state is unable to take that place. Yeah, so taking a more holistic view means we move out of this food aid emergency mode W S T type action mode. Yeah. Uh, Ruth, you, would you like to join in? Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, yes, Helen, uh, I, I think your question is uh, really a, a good, a difficult one. Um, but um, I, I've seen several examples of very successful uh, change from um, especially civil society organization being active in activities and then uh, being forced to change uh, and, and to really uh, been able to um, uh, to support livelihoods, new ways for people to, to pursue livelihoods. Uh, in particular, uh, I've been working uh, with NGO in Sudan that um, I thought was crazy when they wanted to dig um, 
wells in the middle of the desert and uh, had these processes of so return where uh, a group called Havaliev uh, invited back. And uh, it was a success, I think, because they had very strong local institutions and, and the people themselves, uh, they were responsible for, for everything, basically. Um, and, and then it worked very well. So I think we can find several successes, but of course we can also find a lot of failures. Uh, but my point is that uh, we um, we don't really give enough priority to, uh, to recovery, to process of return, to, to how that can happen. Because, I mean, there are so many forgotten crises and so many suffering. Do you find that um, when we're thinking of food aid, we're thinking that, oh, it's, it's just the parcel of food that's being given over, which would then sustain them in that, um, in, in that period, rather than the new idea of uh, food system resilience that the World Food Programme is now pioneering, and which um, was the idea that uh, allowed them to get the uh, peace prize what do you think of that well i i still think the, the world food program is uh, is basically doing the food relief in uh, in the direct transfer either in kind or more and more in in cash um to really be able to operationalize new ways of building resilience, I, uh, especially with, with this enormous need now. Um, I, I haven't really seen how it has succeeded. Maybe others in the panel have, uh, but I find it difficult to really say if, if, if that's more the, the, the theory, the rhetoric, or if it's really happening in, in fact. Brilliant. Um, I think we're going to move on to a question from the audience um, aimed at Elisabetta. Um, in Mali, as well as the other Sahel countries, aid workers are very much targeted by armed groups. If starvation is such a cruel and painful aspect of war, how can armed groups hope to better gain control over a region and build legitimacy justifying barriers between people and food aid? I think this is quite a large question. Do you think you'd be able to answer it? Sorry, I'm reading it again. <laughs> so, if I understand correctly, it's about the targeting, uh, how, how food aid can, can reach uh, populations in, well, in general. No, I think it's a, it's a broader question. It's not just about Mali or Sahel, but it's really about the operas operationalization of aid. Um, I mean, uh, I can speak a little bit about the, the, the results we found. And as I, as I mentioned during the presentation, we actually find that uh, households that were more affected by the conflict were least uh, reached by aid. So that kind of uh, gives an idea of how probably things go on the ground. And um, I guess this is probably because it's very difficult to, to reach um, conflict affected um, areas because of the problems with the roads or even the same uh, uh, rebel group that were uh, operating in Mali were uh, opposed um, to, to aid reaching these populations. Um, so, so yeah, I don't, I don't really know if I <laughs> answered the question, but yeah. But if I can add something on what uh, it was um, the, the previous question, I would like to also emphasize uh, um, to build on what Tilman was mentioning and also Ruth that uh, when we think about humanitarian emergencies, we always think of something that is uh, uh, short, no? We always think about something that is fast paced and uh, the, the humanitarian sector needs to get there and maybe operating and then after six months or one year, they wrap up and, and they go home. And this is actually uh, reflecting on the way the humanitarian section operates also in terms of contracts or, or also the fact they don't embed evaluation systems in their operations because they think it should go so fast. But then if you look at the data, 
Um, the, the biggest recipient of humanitarian aid uh, in 2018 were all long-term recipients. So we are thinking about uh, a context uh, or countries that have been receiving humanitarian emergency aid for more than eight years, okay? So I guess we should also uh, reframe the question. Are we still talking about humanitarian emergencies or are we talking about something else? And I guess the, in this case, then the, the answer will change because uh, as Tilman and Ruth mentioned, we shouldn't think about, uh, yeah, addressing needs with your um, food aid uh, basket or box, but really thinking about building back these economies. And, uh, and obviously, I mean, this is maybe my bias because my, most of my research is on, on children, but really um, protecting these children and really investing them or in their mothers as, as was highlighted by uh, Alex's presentation, I think it's key part of the recovery. So it's not just building uh, the capital, so infrastructure, obviously this is a, a big part, but also thinking about the people that are experiencing these shocks that will have the consequences uh, uh, that go much beyond the emergency itself. I, I think you've, you've hit the mark there. I think uh, there needs to be that um, perspective change where um, food aid or assistance is not classed as post-conflict uh, relief, but then it's more going in towards the state building and uh, the resilience building after conflict. And I think that's a great idea that probably needs more research on. Um, as a, I think a final question, if, oh no, we've got a couple more. Um, uh, post to everyone from Emma, can individuals do anything to combat food insecurity or does change have to come from a national or international policy level? So could you recap that, please? Oh, Sorry, I... um, can individuals do anything to combat food insecurity, or does change have to come on a national or international policy level? That's a great question. <laughs> One million um, dollar question. <laughs> yeah, is the individual responsible for what happens to the world? Yeah, maybe one billion. Yeah, <laughs> but then. If that question comes from somebody who lives and studies in London, I think the share of your responsibility is a lot more than one, one, uh, one, sorry, eighth of a billion, whatever, however you say that, yeah, it's such a small number, but you know, is, is larger than your share in the global world population because chances are, for example, your carbon account is much larger, yeah, than, than that of many people in many other countries. Um, your, your food choices are just in dollar terms worth more. Um, so, of course, we all, you know, it makes a difference what we do, yeah, how we live and what we eat makes a difference, I think. Now, I don't think you should feel guilty about every single, I don't know, you know, piece of salami that you put in your mouth, but, uh, but how the, your food is sourced and how, where it comes from and whether you eat blueberries in January in London, which are farmed in Chile. I don't want the farmer in Chile to be unemployed, but, you know, is that really the best way of using your, your very limited carbon account that you have, yeah? Where do you go on holiday? What uh, do you buy bottled mineral water from, from Southern France, even if you live in London and the tap water is actually quite decent, you know? So the, I think these are real choices you can make, which, which have an impact, whether they impact people in the Sahel zone in the short term, I don't know, yeah? But um, it's, all, it's all connected, I think. That's what I was trying to say earlier, yeah? Um, so I think it does make a difference how we, how we feed ourselves and how we live, basically. Uh, Ruth, your hand is still raised. Uh, would you like to join in? Yes, please. Um, I, I also think yeah, it's it's an excellent question. What could uh, individuals do? Um, um, in, in in my view, um, individuals can really take part in so many kind of solidarity action work, civil society organisation, youth organisation, and um, and I think that kind of solidarity work where um, you also are part of kind of raising awareness, discussing, um, changing attitudes, uh, getting people to understand better what's happening in the world when it comes to hunger and, um, and famine. Uh, so that kind of um, organizations, uh, I think it's extremely, uh, they do very, very good work and to join those um, 
uh, I, I think can make a difference. It's this saying uh, that everybody, each of us can save the world, but we can't do it alone. We have to do it together with other people. Uh, but I also think uh, there is this kind of now direct uh, support platforms. Uh, I was very surprised when my um, when a colleague of mine at work said he was supporting for uh, women entrepreneurs in the Philippines by this kind of direct platform support. So uh, that's another way um, that seems to be really gaining popularity. That 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 you can have this direct way. So helping other people. I haven't seen uh, much of late. Know how. To what degree that is really contributing towards change, saving the world from hunger and famine. But uh, I, I think there are new ways coming, and it's interesting to see um, that uh, you can really motivate people much more when when they feel kind of that direct link. Uh, so um, I am optimistic that uh, that individual, individuals in the UK in Norway can do quite a lot. Thank you. I think another question has just come in that I think, Ruth, that you'd probably like to weigh in on. It's about um, uh, seeds and plants um, as food aid rather than just the, the parcel of food, but the um, capability for farmers then to create uh, seeds. Um, would you like to expand on that yeah this is something i've been working on so so thank you for that question um i'm i've been working in in countries in africa like yeah, malawi and yeah, where they have been serious hunger especially malawi and um, the evaluations and the results we've seen from what we call starter packets i think have been really, really good and much more uh, low cost than to provide uh, good relief and also um, uh, the dignity for people instead of queuing up in lives to receive uh, food relief. I mean, they are able to support themselves. So everybody would like that and get that the kind of charity that comes with a food relief. So, um, starter pack is this with fertilizer, um, can have a, a very good impact on those who, of course, have land then. Uh, but if you are displaced, you don't have land. It's difficult. In Uganda, in fact, displaced people are getting land. Uganda has lots of refugees also from neighboring countries. and. Uh, they are given land, they get this, what you call the displacement economics, and um, uh, the, the displaced people are able to, to grow their own food. And it, it creates a lot of duties in, in the local community. So there are very many ways you, you can help. And I think to give in kind food relief is, is, uh, is not very popular. Uh, anymore, it's it's more cash based, or it's uh, in other ways like these starter packages. Uh, but US is of course still providing a lot of income food relief. Um, what they usually do is that they give uh, food for free for for American NGOs, and then the American NGOs will take it to, for example, Africa, uh, sell it very low cost to local people and um, use the income to, to fund their uh, NGO activities. And, and this, of course, has been heavily criticized because the market for local farmers are then disappearing. So um, this is also one reason why there is, is, is a very big drive for cash and not in kind. Thank you. And we've just had another question come in. I think it's probably directed towards um, Professor Alex, but um, I'll just read it aloud just in case anyone else wants to weigh in. Um, 
it's about escorting food aid uh, using the military when the need arises in Tigray. If it cannot be answered. By no means, I'm a conscientious objector, so I never surfed, so I'm not an expert on driving army trucks. But what, one thing that strikes me is when you come to the point where you have to save lives, you know, using army trucks, then then something has gone terribly wrong a long time ago. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm not saying it's not worth it. It should probably be done if that's a possibility. But but it, um, I think that there was this earlier question about the aid workers. It's similar. Yeah, so how do you stop people from attacking? What you need is you need strong and equitable institutions which care about people. Yeah? And if you have that, then you'll never need an army truck either to protect the aid or humanitarian workers or to deliver the food aid. Yeah, and so I think. We, we, we mustn't lose sight of what we are aiming for and what the system should be. Now, there are institutions in the North which are very weak and vulnerable and people fall through the cracks and not everybody's being cared for properly. But of course, there are even more cracks in the system in the global South. And so there, there's a millions and hundreds of millions of people who are not getting the help they should. The, the schooling for their children is poor. You know, the roads are weak. The... Um, agricultural extension services are weak, etc. Yeah, it's, it's possible to improve these things. And we basically know how to do it. It's more a question of inequalities in the political system, um, which and, and the persistence of weak forms of governance, which which keep it like that. Yeah, it's not a technocratic lack of knowledge on how to help people or how to make it work. And it's not even a lack of money as such. Yeah, the world has never been as rich as it has been now in aggregate or per capita. So we have the resources, we have the know-how, it's sort of the politics that's the missing and the, the institutions. Yeah, so that would be my view on on this and hopefully trying to tie it um, a little bit together as well. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. I think we have to wrap up now, but I would like to uh, thank all of our speakers here today. We've had some brilliant presentations and we've answered quite a few questions. And I'd like to thank all the audience for coming as well. Our next